What is the difference between a set which is two-dimensional and one that is three-dimensional? We say that a photo of a chair is a 2D representation of a three-dimensional object because the actual chair has height, width, and depth. But its photograph only shows us the height and width. So the rough answer to our initial question is that the two-dimensional set lives inside of a plane while a set that is three-dimensional fills up a portion of space. Would that be a good answer? That seems to be the case for many sets, because triangles, squares, and circles can be easily drawn on a plane, while shapes like tetrahedra, cubes, and spheres cannot be. But what if we take something like the surface of a sphere? It looks to us two-dimensional, much like a flat sheet of paper. But this contrasts with the actual solid sphere itself, which clearly takes three dimensions to describe it. Would this mean, therefore, that the first initial very rough definition was actually incorrect? Not exactly. If we look at it from a linear algebra perspective, the set of points x, y, z satisfying this equation is the surface of a sphere of radius 1 in R3 centered at the origin. Although the sphere itself is an object embedded in R3, any point in R3 can be reached starting from the sphere and moving linearly in any direction. So the set is three-dimensional because it cannot be contained in a plane. But this isn't very fair. The surface of a sphere, when considered as an entity in itself, does not occupy any volume. Surely, there should be a way to describe the surface of the sphere in a two-dimensional way. This example tells us something. The dimension of a set varies according to the definition we are using, and they are often incompatible with one another. One basic definition of dimension is the number of coordinates one needs to specify a point. Physicists would call it the degrees of freedom of the system. This can be used to justify the earlier understanding of the surface of a sphere being two-dimensional. Any point can be specified by giving it a longitude and latitude. But this definition is a little tricky to make rigorous, because you could technically define a point on the sphere using just one number. For example, take pi and Euler's number. You can take these two and interleave the digits to form a new number from which the two original numbers can be recovered. You start with the first digit of pi, and then first digit of e, followed by the second digit of pi, the second digit of e, and so on. This is of course really, really artificial, but it does reduce it to one number instead of two. But it's not only that that's the problem with our original definition. We can even find a continuous function f from the closed interval 0, 1 to the surface of a sphere. It's a simple one-dimensional line segment, including both endpoints. Basically what I'm saying is that we can have a single one-dimensional line segment 0, 1 correspond to a two-dimensional surface, the sphere, in a way that covers every point on the sphere exactly once. This idea seems counterintuitive, because it seems to defy the usual understanding of dimensions. But weirdly enough, it is possible. This involves space-filling curves, which are special types of continuous curves that, although one-dimensional, completely fill entire two-dimensional regions, like this piano curve, first discovered by Giuseppe Piano in 1890 which is a continuous curve that passes through every point of a square. In a sphere, you could theoretically design a continuous function that maps every number in the interval 0, 1 to a distinct point on the sphere's surface. Such a function would effectively unfold the one-dimensional line into a two-dimensional surface in a continuous, smooth manner. In order to solve this, we need to define what we mean by a natural coordinate system. This leads us to the definition of a manifold. What we do is take our sphere and select our local area, which we'll call N. We map this area, using the map phi, to correspond to this area to a Euclidean space R2. This essentially allows us to treat this area of the sphere as flat or two-dimensional and make it much easier to deal with points and lines within the area. If you want to know more about this in detail, check out the video that we put in the description below. Thus, at its core, the intuition that a d-dimensional set is one where d numbers are needed to specify a point can indeed be developed into a rigorous definition 
which will tell us that the surface of a solid sphere is two-dimensional. But we're not quite done yet. Let's say I want to cut a piece of paper into two pieces. The boundary of each cut piece will be a curve. We think of this curve as one-dimensional. Why? Because you only need one parameter to describe it. For example, position along the line. Let's use the same reasoning for this. Take the curve and cut it in half. The part where the two remaining pieces will meet each other will be a single point, or a pair of points if we're talking about a loop. This point is zero-dimensional, because it has no length, width, or depth. This creates the principle that dividing a d-dimensional object creates a boundary of dimension d-1. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. So let's say d is the number of dimensions of the plane, the sheet of paper, which is 2. The resulting curve has dimension d, which in this case is 2, minus 1. So the curve has dimension d minus 1, or 1. Let's try to be more precise. Say we have the set x, which is a solid sphere of radius 2, and it contains the points x and y. Let x be the center of the sphere, 0, 0, 0, and y be a point on the boundary of the sphere, say 2, 0, 0. Now say there's a surface of a smaller sphere of radius 1, centered at the origin. We'll call it y. y is something known as a barrier. Any continuous path from the center to the boundary point must pass through y. There is no way to go around the smaller sphere without intersecting it, because the entire path is confined to the solid sphere x. Now, a 2D barrier is sufficient enough to divide the solid sphere x, so x is at most three-dimensional. But a 1D barrier, for example a curve, cannot divide x. It would leave the rest of the sphere connected. Thus, if we follow the d-1 rule, x is not at most 2D, confirming that x is exactly 3D. y which divides it has to be 2D. The line that connects x and y is 1D, and the point at which it is cut by the barrier is 0D. Formally, x is at most d-dimensional if between any two points in x there exists a barrier of at most d-1 dimensional. A problem can arise with that definition of dimension when we construct a pathological set x that acts as a barrier between any two points in a plane, but contains no segment of any curve. A pathological set is a set with strange counterintuitive properties that challenge our usual geometric intuition. For example, imagine a set X that is so irregular that it acts as a barrier between any two points in the plane R2, meaning no continuous path can connect the points without passing through X. By the definition, X would be considered a barrier. But it might not contain any segment of a curve, which we intuitively expect from a 1D object. Instead, x could be zero-dimensional, like a collection of points. However, if a zero-dimensional set like x can block paths from the plane, the definition implies that the plane is at most 1D, which is clearly wrong. So, a zero-dimensional set, like a collection of points, could act as a barrier in a 2D space, falsely suggesting that the plane is only one-dimensional. But this is resolved with a small modification to the original definition that is called the inductive dimension of a set, introduced by Lewitson Brouwer. We're not gonna get into it here, because we have a lot of concepts of dimension to go through, but if you're curious to know more, please let us know in the comment section below. Anyway, this leads us to Lebesgue's covering dimension. It doesn't superficially look like something that has to do with dimensions, but you might be very surprised to know that it actually does. Covering a set means finding a collection of smaller sets that together contain the entire original set. For example, to cover an interval x equals 0, 1, the open interval of real numbers, so an interval that does not contain the endpoints 0 and 1, use a collection of smaller open intervals like 0, 0 0.4, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and 1. These intervals cover x because every point in the interval 0, 1 lies inside at least one of these smaller intervals. The smaller intervals will overlap with each other to ensure no gaps, 
and you can do it in such a way that no point is contained in more than two of your intervals. Just start with each new interval close to the end of the previous one. Now, say we want to do that with a square. It's a set that does not contain the boundary of the square, and we cover it with other smaller squares. All of them will have to overlap. But this time, some of the points will have to overlap in at least three little squares, right? If you stack them like this, you can do the covering in such a way that no four squares overlap. The rule of thumb seems to be that to cover a d-dimensional set, be it a line, square, cube, whatever, the overlaps are at least d plus 1 and do not need to be greater than that. Thus, the precise definition is that a set X is at most d-dimensional if, for every finite cover U of X, you can refine the cover to a new finite open cover V, such that VI also covers the whole set X. Each VI is fully contained in at least one of the original UI. No point in X is contained in more than D plus one elements of VI. This definition is general enough not only to apply to subsets of Rn, like lines, squares, or cubes, but also to other topological spaces. The final idea about dimension will be how it affects the way we measure size. If we want to figure out how big X is, then we give it length. It's one-dimensional. If we give it area, it is two-dimensional. If we give it volume, it is three-dimensional. This will assume that you already know what dimension is. You're not trying to figure it out, but it will actually say that there is a way of deciding which one it is, without determining the dimension in advance. The dimension can be defined to be the number that corresponds to the best measure. We will use the fact that length, area, and volume scale in different ways when the shape is expanded. If we take a curve and expand it by a factor of 2 in all directions, its length doubles. Generally speaking, if we expand it by c, it grows by c. If we take a shape which is two-dimensional and expand it by c, it multiplies by c squared. This is generally speaking, because each portion of the shape expands in two directions, so the area has to be multiplied by c twice. When it is a 3D object, it multiplies by c cubed, because it scales in three directions, and so on. It may still appear as though we have to decide in advance whether length, area, or volume will be talked about before understanding how it'll scale, but that's actually not the case. If we take a square and scale it by a factor of 2, the new square can be divided into four smaller squares, each congruent to the original square. The side length doubles in two directions, horizontally and vertically. So the area becomes 2 squared, which is 4 times the original area. So scaling reveals the dimensionality of an object without needing to decide in advance whether we're measuring in length, area, or volume. This has a very interesting consequence. There are sets to which it is natural to assign a dimension that is not an integer. The simplest example is a Cantor set. Start with a closed interval, so including the endpoints, 0, 1. Call it x0. Then we form a set x1 by removing the middle third of x0. So all the points between 1 third and 2 thirds, leaving 1 third and 2 thirds themselves. x1 is therefore the union of the closed intervals, 0, 1, 3, and 2 thirds to 1. Next, we remove the middle thirds of these two closed intervals to produce a set x2. So x2 is this. And so on, repeated indefinitely. Generally speaking, xn is a union of closed intervals. xn plus 1 is what you get when you remove the middle thirds of each interval. Basically, xn plus 1 consists of twice as many intervals as xn, but they are a third of the size. Once the sequence x0, x1, x2, and so on is produced, you define the Cantor set to be the intersection of all the xi. That is, all the real numbers that remain, no matter how far you go in this process of removing the middle thirds. To figure out the dimension of the Cantor set, we analyze its scaling behavior using the formula for fractal dimension d. n equals c to the power of d. 
N is the number of pieces or intervals. C is the scaling factor, how much smaller each piece becomes. The point is that by analyzing how the number of pieces and their sizes change during scaling, we can compute dimension, even for sets that are highly fragmented like the Cantor set. Cantor sets have other very interesting properties, and there are many, many more ways of defining dimensions, of course. One interesting way is through homology and cohomology. So, if you're interested in knowing more about this, please let us know in the comment section below. This video was based on the Princeton Companion to Mathematics, link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one. I'm sure you're going to love it. See you guys there.